Chapter 40, My Friend Though Jiraiya had battled countless opponents of all shapes and sizes over the years, he was finding it difficult to believe that the man before him was actually human. Scuttling across the rooftops on all fours, an iron tail whipped out from the man's cloak towards Jiraiya, who leaped backwards. Without pause, the man's mouth opened, and a barrage of senban needles rapidly shot out. They would have hit Jiraiya if it weren't for his white mane technique protecting him. As it was, the needles deflected off and bounced harmlessly down to the ground. Landing a distance away, Jiraiya waited for his opponent to pursue him. However, as he'd suspected, the man didn't move from his rooftop. It seemed that no matter how many times Jiraiya attempted to move the battle outside of the village walls, the man wouldn't follow him. It was clear that while his intended opponent was Jiraiya, his primary goal was to protect the perimeter of the barrier, walling off the Hakage and Orochimaru. That alone told Jiraiya his opponent was different from the others he'd faced in the organization so far. Rather than fighting for the love of battle or to quench his bloodthirst, this man fought with purpose. This was an issue, of course, because it meant that Jiraiya couldn't summon Gamabunta. And while Jiraiya thought he could eventually outmaneuver the puppeteer with the village as a battleground, he wanted to minimize collateral damage as much as possible. Jiraiya-sama, are you alright? The dark-haired ninja appeared besides him, with a team of three young shinobi in tow. If it isn't Asuma, exclaimed Jiraiya, don't write me off just because I've started to develop a bit of a gut. Lips rearing back in a grim smile, Asuma held up a pair of blades. I wouldn't dream of it. We're here to help. What's your plan for this clown? Funny you should ask. Biting into his thumb, Jiraiya painted two red lines on his face and brought his hands together. I can't take my hands apart for a while, so I'm going to need you all to buy me some time. Yugido POV While it would have been faster to travel in her transformed state, the blue flames were too conspicuous, and Yugido did not like her odds against a long-ranged opponent. A distance away in the sky, she could make out the white speck that was the strange flying organism belonging to the Akatsuki intruders. Hiding her presence as best as she could while maintaining a pace that wouldn't falter behind, Yugido had been following their tail for the past few hours. They had since left Lightning Country behind and were now skirting the border of Frost Country. Either that, or they were already in Hot Water Country. Yugido wasn't always the best at sensing direction. Slowly but surely, Yugido could feel the drain of the past day beginning to weigh her down. The village had burned down to ashes. The Rikage was gone. Her friends were all dead or missing. I, for one, am finding this new situation very agreeable, purred the two tails. Despite herself, Yugido didn't even have the energy to snap back as she usually did. It wasn't as though she had expected the cat demon to have any tact in the first place, she had far more pressing matters to consider. Unexpectedly, her silence seemed to unsettle the two tails, and it fell blissfully silent, allowing Yogito to think as she raced through the tundra, eyes fixed on her target. The moment to strike would be when the intruders landed. Whether her opponents were number one, or two, or the entire Akatsuki organization. It didn't matter. Yogito didn't know if Killer B was even alive, nor what the Akatsuki were trying to accomplish. But she couldn't leave him behind. Not again. Leaf Village Watch out! Asuma, who had been weaving in and out of their opponent's offensive, let out a roar as another storm of Senban rained down on a rooftop. His lone female student threw herself out of the way in the nick of time. When suddenly, she froze, collapsing in a heap of limbs. A small gash on her arm gleamed bright red, it seemed a single needle had brushed against her. Poison? Eno! shouted her teammates, rushing to her side. As Jiraiya had feared, their opponent seemed to be overpowering Asuma and his team. It was difficult to sit back and allow them to cover for him. Fortunately, his preparations were nearly complete. In a burst of cloudy smoke, two toads appeared on his shoulders. Fukasaku and Shima. His longtime allies who gathered natural energy for him. And I thought you didn't like this form, said Fukasaku. Jiraiya grimaced as he felt his nose growing bulbous. Now is not the time to be particular about my appearance. His senses rapidly scaling up, Jiraiya noticed something interesting about his opponent everything he could see of the man. Whether it was the face, oddly stiff in its movements, or the tail. Appeared to be connected to thin chakra threads. A puppet. That explained the unnaturalness of his enemy. It wasn't human after all, but a puppet. Jiraiya had heard of the rumors of the master puppeteer within the Akatsuki's ranks, and now he had a face for the name. So sorry of the red sand. Unlike a normal puppet, however, the chakra threads appeared to be leading inwards. 
Jureya had never seen the like, and yet the more he thought about it, the more sense it made. Was the actual puppeteer inside the puppet? Fall back. Jureya shouted to Asuma. Take your team to safety. Asuma grimly regarded his student, before looking up at the rooftop beyond Sasari. At the violet barrier surrounding the Hakage and Arachimaru. Looking torn, he said, please. Protect my father. You underestimate that old man, said Jureya. He'll be fine. His tone must have been overly jovial, Asuma only responded with a grim nod, before picking up his student and disappearing. The sage, Jureya, said Sasari, the puppet's tail arched inquisitively. I've heard much about you. You will make a most excellent addition to my collection. It happened in the blink of an eye. Shima and Fukasaku's tongues burst out, and Jureya leaped forward. One muscular tongue wrapped around Sasari's tail, neutralizing it, while the other bound the puppet's mouth. Jureya pulled back his hand to Rasengan the puppet to oblivion, when Sasari raised his left arm, revealing what appeared to be a torpedo. The good puppet master always had another trick up his sleeve. But, they had never had to face off against a toad sage. Jureya's white mane rose up to defend him from the impending shrapnel, and his fist connected solidly with the head of Sasori's puppet. The puppet was surprisingly durable. While it was a blow that would have pulverized anyone else's head into pieces, in the case of the puppet, its face caved inwards, before the entire puppet blew back, spinning bodily through the air. It crashed into the roof of a nearby building, sending the entire infrastructure crumbling to the ground. Jureya winced. Oh dear. Jureya. Chided Shima. There's no time for that now. The barrier. Fukasaku urged. With one last look down at the rising smoke, Jureya leaped up the tiled rooftops to his target. Four violet walls rose up around several different figures who appeared to be locked in combat. Several? Taking in the faces of the new combatants, Jureya realized with a jolt. They were the first and second Hakage, apparently back from the dead to follow Orochimaru's every bidding. Just what had his old teammate been up to over the years? Several Anbu. Apparently helpless to do anything besides shout verbal encouragements. Observed the battle from outside the barrier. Even if the shape and form are the same, they are neither the first nor second Hakage. I know. Responded the third. Despite his words, Jureya knew his teacher. The internal turmoil he must have been feeling at fighting the previous Hakage would no doubt cause him to subconsciously hold himself back. Jureya had to step in, and fast. Besides, this was his fight. But before he could make a move, Jureya tensed. And leaped up, just as a wave of puppet arms crashed into the rooftop. As he flew back, he looked down to see a red-headed man in Akatsuki robes regarding him from the ground. A large, hulking puppet hovered in the air behind him. I'd been wondering when you'd clamber out of that wreckage, Jureya called out. Meanwhile. Other part of village. Ajisai's mission had seemed simple enough. Keep an eye on the Jinchuriki, and if it seemed like he was going to get away, crush the wooden scarab they'd given her. Presumably, it would alert whoever was controlling the scarab. However, it was easier said than done, as was usually the case. Once the Jinchuriki transformed, Adjusai and Haku were forced to retreat, and Adjusai was forcibly reminded of the existence of powers she couldn't even fathom. It was another awe-inspiring display of Lord Payne's prowess, and she was honored to be even given the chance to observe from afar. But for some reason, this time, Adjusai found it harder to swallow than usual. Surprisingly, the hidden leaf didn't back down without a fight. After several others kept the beast at bay for some time, Ajisai watched in disbelief as a leaf nin eventually showed up and, with a single blow, forced the beast to transform back into the Jinchuriki. It was a world utterly unbeknownst to her, and Ajisai was prepared to crush the scarab when Haku stopped her with a shake of his head. She might have been preparing herself to turn him over to the hidden sound, but she trusted him. That was, until Haku suddenly disappeared. Ajisai froze and looked around. Where had he gone? While he'd been quiet all day, she had attributed it to the mysterious seal. All of a sudden, she began to frantically wonder if he'd somehow overheard her conversation with the Jonan. In a flash, Haku reappeared. Or at least, she thought it was him. He was wearing a mask she'd never seen before. Taking a lurching step, Haku stumbled towards her, and she rushed to support him. Haku, what did you do? Run. He gritted out. The trees rustled, and a young blonde leaf nin appeared on the other side of the clearing. As soon as he caught sight of them, his face contorted in such fury, Ajisai felt herself take an inadvertent step back. Mind destruction technique, cried the leaf nin. While Haku dove to the side, Ajisai felt something very strange happen to her body. Against her will, each hand drew a kunai from her holster. As she watched on in horror, she lunged at her teammate. Clang, 
a blade that hadn't been there a moment before struck out to meet hers. Adjusai found herself face to face with an Anbu mask. Another leaf nin. Before she could cry out, the Anbu parried her other kunai, before snaking below her defenses and elbowing her in the face. Adjusai felt her nose crack. As she let out a cry of pain, her hands reached up to her face, and she realized she was back in control of her limbs. The leaf nin yelled, hey, I was control. He broke off. Eyes watering and her hands full of blood, Adjusai looked up to see the leaf nin collapse to the ground. The Anbu turned towards her. Are you all right? Sorry about that. Who are you? Adjusai demanded thickly. Don't worry. I'm on your side. Reaching up with a hand, the Anbu removed his mask to reveal a young man with glasses. You can call me Kabuto. Jureya POV Following the third Kazakage's mysterious and abrupt disappearance, the sudden power vacuum from his absence had left the hidden sand in a state of chaos. It would not be an understatement to say that the third's disappearance had played a critical role in the beginning of the hidden sand's decline. Even now, years later, Jureya knew that the village was still searching for the man who'd once been hailed as the strongest Kazakage ever. Now, Jureya knew exactly what had happened to the third. He had become Sasari's human puppet. A wave of black iron powder crashed onto the ground, just as Jureya leaped away. He felt a particle just barely miss his skin, and a shiver ran down his spine. He knew that a single instant's contact could have very well ended him. The depths to which man could fall would never cease to astound Jureya, Sasari had sacrificed a brilliant future with the hidden sand in order to obtain the third's iron sand. While it seemed the peak of foolishness to Jureya, perhaps the exchange was worth it for some. Jureya didn't know too much about the legendary technique, but he knew that if he hadn't had the toads on his shoulders gathering natural energy for him, the battle may very well have already reached its conclusion. Suddenly, Jureya's eyes widened. He turned back, his heart lurching violently. Just barely visible through the walls of the purple barrier, a gaunt specter with horns rose out from behind the third Hakage. Sensei, he breathed. No. As though listening to his pleas, the wall suddenly vanished, and Jureya realized the sound Nin must have released the barricade. Without a second's thought, Jureya launched himself through the air. When he landed, Jureya found himself in his worst nightmare. One that he couldn't wake up from. With a single glance, he knew in an instant what had just taken place. What the third had sacrificed. Arachimaru's arms hung like two slabs of meat from his shoulders. His stricken eyes were fixed on the third as the latter fell lifelessly to the ground. Sensei, cried Jureya, rushing to his teacher's side. He propped up the third on his lap, shaking him, all the while knowing it was futile. The Reaper Death Seal was unbreakable, and no matter what, the user paid the price with their life. The third stirred, his mouth drawing back in a last smile. Jureya, I leave it. To you. And then he was gone. In the stark sunlight, without the shade of the Hakage's hat, Jureya saw how lined the third's face had become over the years. Bowing his head, he carefully lowered the body to the ground, marveling at how someone once regarded as a god could have become something so fragile. Let's go, he heard Arachimaru grit through his teeth to his subordinates, who jumped to their leader's side. I leave it to you. Standing up, Jureya took in a deep breath. He looked towards Arachimaru. There, in his gaunt face, Jureya found no trace of sadness or regret. There was only anger and hatred, and he felt his heart lurch at the realization. Jureya took a step towards Arachimaru and then another. To the others watching, all they must have seen was a blur. But to Jureya, each step that brought him closer seemed to stretch into eternity. Eventually, there shall come a day when you will be forced to make a critical decision. That choice you make will decide which way the change goes. He had run from this decision for years, refusing to choose. He had hoped that by sticking to the path of a pacifist, it would all work out on its own that he could become someone who could change the hearts of people with his stories, that his fragmented team would each find their way home. However, after having hoped and and waited for so long, the third was gone, and the village was in flames, and all at once, Jureya understood. Some people didn't change. Not because they couldn't, but because they chose not to. While it was a bitter pill to swallow, Jureya knew that he couldn't run from it any longer. Memories of the past flashed through Jureya's head as he drew close. Arachimaru's eyes widened. Fukasaku and Shima's tongues thrust out at Arachimaru's subordinates, batting them aside. They had once fought on the same team, and Jureya had loved Arachimaru as a brother. He would have done anything for him. He would have died for him. Jureya pulled back his arm, a massive chakra churning wildly in his hand. Goodbye, my friend, he said soberly. Outside Village 
the lone man, dressed simply in mesh armor and pants, staggered from the forest clearing surrounding the hidden leaf. Momentarily hunching over on his knees to catch his breath, he glanced up at the sight of rising smoke from beyond the walls. A shadow of a grimace twisting his mouth, he ripped off his hit I-8 and threw it to the side. A slashed leaf briefly gleamed in the light before tumbling to the ground. The man lurched forward, his mind racing. He had never expected to return to the hidden leaf this way. A skeleton of his former self, muscle withered away to skin and bone. It hurt to even breathe, so walking was excruciating. And yet, he had to move, so he did, joints creaking in protest with every step he took, lungs burning with every cough. It was after what felt like an eternity that the man reached the gates. While they should have been strictly manned, they had been abandoned and left ajar. Nonetheless, feeling some trepidation, he stepped inside, waiting for a challenge that never came. All too easily, the village sprawled out before him. He felt his stomach plummet. Even way out here, the bodies on the streets were plainly visible. While most appeared to be ninja killed in action, he could make out the remains of some unlucky civilians as well, and the sight caused his heart to ache. It was a pain even more visceral than the one he felt every waking moment. He would have wept if he'd had the strength. What had been the point of it all? Had so many innocent lives been sacrificed for the mere purpose of staving off the leaf's destruction? He had once left the village a traitor and a murderer, and he now returned to it a dying man. He had been foolish to think that all of his plans could have made a difference. Despite his efforts, everything had gone awry, leaving him with nothing but the sense that he was a lone cog in a machine that followed no one's bidding. Still, this was his last chance. He didn't know how much longer he had left. Days? Hours? It was time to put all of his plans to the side. What mattered now was that in whatever time he had left, this was his last chance to deliver all the information he had gathered over the years. His last chance to see his brother. End of chapter 40 Chapter 41, The Rain Stops When Kakashi stumbled forward and Naruto instinctively jumped out to grab him, his first thought was that it had to be a clone. Kakashi had to have switched himself with a body replacement jutsu. Any second now, the clone would dissipate, and the jonin would jump down from a tree, with a hand holding Jiraiya's latest book. But Kakashi didn't disappear, and Naruto instead found himself staring down at a graying face. The bloody tip of a blade poked out from the jonin's chest, it was a blow strong enough to have dissipated even a shadow clone. Which could only mean one thing. Sensei, Naruto said, dumbly. When Kakashi didn't respond, he turned to the bound sand nin. Can any of you heal? Suddenly, he thought of all the times he'd passed over a medical ninjutsu scroll in favor of a ninjutsu one, and he felt his stomach twist. It's unfortunate, said the sand jonin. A blade straight through the heart like that. His throat turned dry, Naruto swallowed hard. What are you trying to say? It was a stupid question. The sand jonin looked plainly down at Kakashi in response. Naruto followed his gaze and saw that his teacher's face had turned to Shen. That had to be wrong, so Naruto pressed his fingers to the crease of his neck and he couldn't find a pulse. Everything in Naruto's head was starting to spin. How could this be happening? Not ten minutes ago, they'd been talking by the stadium. They were going to have a rematch soon. Sensei, he repeated. Again, there was no response. Naruto's grip slackened, and Kakashi's hand dropped limply to the ground. Seeing that, Naruto felt something deep inside him tremble. Watch out, the voice cried. Dazed, Naruto looked up. An anvil wielding a blade had just broken out of the trees and was now heading straight for him. Was it an enemy disguised as one of their own? As drained as he was, it would have been a simple matter for him to parry the attack with his tanto. But he didn't move. Instead, he was suddenly filled with a deluge of thoughts and faces. His childhood caretaker. May's mother. The other Jinchuriki taken by the Akatsuki before him. Rai. Mayu. Shirakumo. The undercover agent in Earth Country. Tamari. And now, Kakashi. There were so many that had died before him. Because of him, if not for him, would they still be alive? The Amba was almost on top of him, the blade flashing in the sunlight, and Naruto thought fleetingly. Did it matter? Karen POV. Her eyes bulging, Karen couldn't believe what she was seeing. Why isn't he moving? The Ambu attacker, seizing the opportunity, had gone straight for Naruto. It left him wide open, and knowing Naruto, he had ample opportunity to evade the attack. And yet, for some reason, he didn't move. Eyes fixed upon the descending blade, she jerked forward. The chains had disappeared once Gara had fallen unconscious, and they didn't come out of her a second time. She was going to be too late. Naruto, she screamed. Clang, 
All of a sudden, a blade met the Anbu's blade. It took Karen another second to process that it was Naruto's. Somehow, suddenly, Naruto had responded. The blow had sent the Anbu jerking back, his mask dislodged and fell off his face to reveal a young man with glasses. At that, a faint look of surprised recognition flickered across Naruto's face. You. Work for Akatsuki? The man's lips curled back. I thought I'd try my luck, he said, without responding to Naruto's question. But. His gaze shot to the side, where Gara lay unconscious, while Karen's chains had since disappeared, the sand jonin hovered protectively in front of him. Guess I'll take my chances another time. Almost mockingly, he adjusted his glasses. And then taking a step back, he disappeared. A beat passed. Naruto staggered. Snapping back to attention, Karen hurried forward. Naruto. Without thinking, she grabbed him by the arm. Why hadn't he been moving before? Are you hurt? Stop, said Naruto. Karen blinked. Stop what? Stop talking to me as if you know me. Naruto, let go of me. When Karen didn't move, Naruto raised his voice. Let go of me. Frightened, Karen released his arm. She'd never seen him like this before. Instinctively, she searched blindly for his chakra signature. And what she found caused her heart to plummet. When they had fought in the Chunin exams in Wind Country all those years ago, he had been ruthless and intent, focused solely on his own team. When she had caught sight of Naruto in grass country, his chakra had seemed meandering, but still purposeful. When they had crossed paths in the forest of death and on the training fields, he had been reserved and controlled. Now, looking at Naruto, the only word that came to Karen's mind was lost. And the cause of it all. Karen's gaze drew down to the still body in his arms. Was he Naruto's teacher? The man's chakra signature was rapidly fading away, but she could still catch a glimmer of something. Naruto, I might be able to help. Naruto didn't respond. Perhaps he hadn't heard, or perhaps he was ignoring her. Whichever the case, time was running out. Karen felt her jaw set. While she had never healed anyone who was unconscious before, she had to try. Wrenching open the man's mouth with one free hand. Naruto jerked. She pushed her arm against his teeth. She felt canines pierce her skin, and blood, glowing with her life force, dripped down into his mouth. Karen could feel herself rapidly losing strength, but she clenched her arm, squeezing every drop she could into the other man. Nothing happened. What are you doing? Ignoring Naruto, Karen screamed, bite. A moment passed. And another. Kakashi POV. Where am I? The sun was just rising on an early morning, and the villagers were out at market. Walking along a path winding through the village, he bounced excitedly on the balls of his feet. Excited? Him? Kakashi, said a voice he hadn't heard in a long time. He looked up. Up. To see his father smiling down at him. Dad. Are you that happy about finally starting to attend the academy tomorrow? He returned the smile. Yeah. Hmm. We should get something to celebrate. What would you like? I. Boy. Kakashi. A new voice interrupted his thoughts. There you are, you bastard. He veered around to see Abito and Rin speeding up to catch up to him. When he looked back, his father was gone. Is something wrong, Kakashi? Asked Rin curiously. It's nothing, he answered. The sun was high in the sky, beating its heat down on the back of his neck. Suddenly, something hard cracked down on his head, and he winced. Kakashi. I heard from Minato that you almost got killed on that last mission. Now, now, Kashina, let's not exaggerate. Came his teacher's voice. You're telling me ten cracked ribs and a leg in a cast is an exaggeration. Slowly, with a limp to his step, he backed away from the enraged woman when he felt something bump into his back. He turned to see two genin regarding him suspiciously. Kakashi-sensei. Said Rai. Don't you think it's about time you showed us what's under that mask, hmm? Well, how about some ramen? He said. If you're quick enough, you might be able to catch something. Rai's face brightened, but Mei shook her head in disappointment. So you can eat your fill and then leave us with the check again, sensei? He smiled. Can't get anything past you, can I? He looked up at the sky, the sun was starting to set, and the air was cooling. He thought he could catch the faint outline of the moon in the distance. Come on, sensei, hurry up, I'm starving, said Rai. Sensei, aren't you coming? Mayu asked curiously. Oddly enough, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was missing. But he couldn't quite put his finger on what it is. I'm coming, I'm coming, he said jovially, trying to brush it off. Just as he was about to follow his students' backs, he felt a hand grab his arm. Sensei, said a voice. Kakashi opened his eyes. It took a moment to reorient himself. His body was aching, he could feel a strange chakra rushing through him, 
stitching him back together. The missing eye no longer seared, and the injury in his chest had been reduced to a mere throb. And through it all, Naruto's blurry face looked down at him, shocked and uncertain. Sensei? That's me, Kakashi croaked. Red locks of hair spilled around him, looking to his side, Kakashi saw the girl who had reminded him of Kashina. She was unconscious, her face pale and drawn. There was a metallic taste in his mouth. Blood, but before he could think on it much further, he felt his head spinning. And then once again, he lost consciousness. Hinata POV Hinata was beginning to lose track of how many she'd been able to save and how many she'd eased of their suffering. Thankfully, she wasn't alone, she'd run into several other medic nin, and they divided the village into sectors for each to cover. In the face of such disaster, the fact that Hinata was able to contribute in this way brought a sense of burgeoning pride in her chosen line of work. She wondered what her father would think if he were to see her now. Lowering her hands from her latest patient, Hinata turned to the worried Junin. I've stabilized her condition for now, but get her to the hospital. I heard that the Anbu have erected a barrier, so you should be safe there. Thank you, said the Chunin, scooping up her patient, while her face was still pale, her breathing had somewhat eased. If there's anything I can do. Go. With a nod, the Chunin disappeared. Hinata let out an exhale and stood up. As expected, she was starting to feel the strain of using her Byakugan so many times. Fortunately, the battle seemed to be winding down. While the number of wounded was still disproportionate to the number of available helping hands, the injuries were becoming less critical in nature. Hinata had turned to move on to the next district when she heard a sound. Coughing? Reactivating her Byakugan, Hinata held up her hands in a defensive position and cautiously advanced. There was a man there, hidden behind what used to be a pharmacy but was now a smoking ruin. Hinata turned the corner and saw the man. Deathly pale with black hair, she'd never seen him before, but somehow, he looked oddly familiar. Just as he came into view, he hunched over and heaved. Blood splattered the ground. She didn't know whether he was an ally or an enemy. But she had made an oath to protect the injured, and so she asked, are you alright? At the sound of her voice, the man jerked, his eyes weary and unfocused. For a moment, he looked up at her, but Hinata had the odd sense he wasn't really looking at her at all. An instant later, he broke out into another bloody coughing fit it had been a stupid question. She could tell from a single glance that he was dying. Without any further hesitation, Hinata rushed forward. The moment she touched him, the man stiffened. But as soon as the glow of medical ninjutsu emanated from her hands, the lines in his face relaxed a margin. As Hinata further examined his body, she felt her brow crease. This man wasn't a casualty of the battle. No, the illness in his body was one that had advanced over many years. Judging from the level of damage to his internal organs, it looked as though it had started in his lungs before spreading to the rest of his body. His liver and kidneys were also beyond repair. Likely, a result of abusing pain medication. Hinata had seen the like in some older shinobi, though it was her first time seeing this level of destruction in such a relatively young man. It was a miracle he was even conscious. For a moment, Hinata considered doing what she had done for so many others so far. Stop the weak beating of his heart and allow the man to go peacefully. It was likely the kindest option, given how much pain he must have been in. But just as she'd laid her hands over his heart, she heard him whisper hoarsely. Sasuke. Hinata stopped. As in, Ichiha Sasuke? After a moment's pause, she drew back. Placing her hands instead over his head, she pressed several key points in the man's brain. Slowly, Hinata felt him relax as pain-relieving endorphins spread throughout his body. There wasn't much else she could do for him. Even with the help of her Byakugan, it was far beyond Hinata's capabilities. The disease racking his body was like a million little dust particles scattered throughout his system, destroying him from the inside out. But something in his eyes told her that he wasn't ready to go quite yet. Hinata decided she would take him to the hospital, and once the battle was over, she would look for Sasuke. Though she didn't know him very well. She'd barely talked to him even though they'd been in the same academy year. She figured there must be a good reason for the dying man to have called his name. Sasuke, POV. Lightning flashed. The sound of a thousand chirping birds echoed through the clearing. Before the team of enemy ninja could even retaliate, Sasuke had ripped through their abdomens in a line. Three bodies fell in an identical slump to the ground. The ear-splitting sound faded as he straightened, his eyes glowing dully with the Sharingan. Sasuke, warned Sakura. She needn't have wasted her breath, Sasuke was already turning, his kunai moving in a blur as it slashed across what appeared to be a humanoid puppet creeping up on him. 
His eyes followed the faint glow of chakra string connecting the puppet to its master, and he followed with a quick flurry of shuriken. His aim was true, in a rustling sound, a fourth body toppled out of a tree, landing hard on the ground. Sakura ran up to Sasuke, her eyes shining with admiration. That was amazing. But I expected nothing less from you. Without responding, Sasuke regarded the bodies on the ground. One, two, three, four, five. Was this enough? Had he managed to close the distance even just a little? With the way he was now. Would he be able to defeat Kakashi, Naruto, his brother? I hope everyone's okay, said Sakura, looking back at the rooftops peeking over in the distance. Do you think we should head back? They'll be fine, Sasuke replied. I'm going to check the perimeter once again. Without waiting for a response, he took off. Sakura's footsteps soon followed his. What you found out there? Was it worth it, leaving behind everything? When he had asked the question on that night, Naruto's response hadn't been what Sasuke had expected. If you have to ask, you already know the answer. Eyes narrowing, Sasuke felt his pace pick up in speed. The surrounding scenery became a blur. Sakura's footsteps faded behind him. Jiraiya POV Jiraiya Sama, an Anbu appeared before him, his head bowed in deference. The sound nin have been taken to be interrogated, as you ordered. The aim nin have retreated, and the remaining sand nin have also entered. Very good, he answered, faintly. As soon as the barrier had gone down, with Jiraiya distracted, the missing nin Sasari had disappeared from battle. Presumably, he had fled the village, with how desperately the hidden sand had been searching for the third Kazakage, they would no doubt be very interested in the information Jiraiya now had for them. It begged the question of just how involved the sand had been in the invasion. As well as how deeply the Akatsuki had managed to infiltrate each village. Jiraiya-sama, what is your next command? It seems some of the Anbu had taken the third's dying words quite literally. I leave it to you. Maybe they had been meant to be taken that way. His heart sinking, Jiraiya thought of what inevitably lay ahead. The thorough search would have to be conducted of the hidden leaf as well. Given Sasori's level of mastery and puppetry, Jiraiya would have been surprised if they hadn't slipped a sleeper agent or two within their ranks. It would go a long way towards explaining how such a disaster had managed to sneak up right under their noses. Standing on the rooftop, Jiraiya surveyed the smoking remains of the village around him. A cold breeze swept through the area, a lone leaf swirled through the air. Kakashi POV When Kakashi opened his eyes again, he was no longer on the battlefield. He was in a makeshift hospital room, with an four attached to his arm. It seemed like a supremely unnecessary gesture. Kakashi hadn't felt this great in years. Whatever it was that had fixed him had completely healed even his cracked ribs from his bout with Naruto the previous week. It was dimly lit, it may have been night, or it could have been a new day. Kakashi couldn't tell due to the curtains that surrounded his bed, separating him from his neighbors. The groans and murmurs of a dozen others sounded in his vicinity. A single figure sat besides the bed, red head resting in his hands. Naruto, said Kakashi. At the sound of his voice, Naruto immediately looked up. Seeing Kakashi's face, his expression melted into relief. You're awake. What happened? That hunter nin who was with Zabuza sneaked up on you. I see. I was being too careless. Kakashi swallowed hard, silently rebuking himself. But Naruto shook his head. No, it's my fault. I didn't kill that hunter nin when I had the chance, and he tried to get his revenge. Kakashi winced, the acute memory of being stabbed through his chest was coming back to him in fragments. He came at me in my blind spot. Raising himself up on his elbows, he touched a hand to his bandaged chest. I thought I was a goner for sure. Thank you. Naruto, it wasn't me. Oh, Karen is the one who healed you. Karen? Kakashi repeated thoughtfully. One after another, the girl was full of surprises. Well, I'll have to thank her personally then, when I can. Privately, he thought he would have to inquire after her lineage as well. Naruto nodded. Yes. How's the rest of the village? Any more deaths? Said Kakashi as lightly as he could. Menma tried to go after Haku, but. Well, he's in stable condition now. And last I heard from Sasuke and Sakura, they were still in the search party for wounded. Anyone else? The Hakage is dead. Kakashi breathed in sharply. Raising a hand to the bridge of his nose, he pinched it. Ah. For a moment, the two were silent. Several beds over, the occupant began to cough up what sounded like half of their lung. Suddenly, Kakashi thought of the last time they'd been in the hospital together. Back during the Chunin exams, in the hidden sand, when Naruto had passed out from the effects of the taboo seal. That time around, Naruto had been the one in the hospital bed. You know. 
none of this is your fault, if that's what you're thinking, said Kakashi. Naruto shrugged. Even if it's not my fault, I am one of the reasons this happened. Both today. And before. He wasn't wrong about that. Wherever tragedy struck around Naruto, his Jinchuriki status had always played a role. Is everything all right, Naruto? You're the one in the hospital. You know what I mean. Silence ensued. The curtains surrounding the bed jostled as a pair of cursing medics ran by. Kakashi felt his foot fall asleep. Finally, Naruto said quietly, it's hard, sensei. I know. Does it ever get easier? Kakashi considered it, thinking of all the times he had prayed at his former teammates' graves himself. A bit, over time. There was no response from Naruto, who instead looked down at his lap. Kakashi felt his gaze soften. His student had led a difficult life, exceptionally so, even for a ninja. And when Naruto kept so much to himself, it was increasingly easier to forget how young he still was. The curtains shook again. This time, someone entered the adjacent room. As voices started to murmur, Naruto got up to leave. Kakashi cleared his throat. Our team. Let's visit their grave together soon. It was something he had meant to bring up for some time now, and he felt ashamed it had taken him so long to finally do so. Naruto stopped, his back turned to Kakashi. A beat passed, a still moment in which unfamiliar voices sounded in the dim light, and Kakashi held his breath. And then, he nodded. Right, he said in a tight voice. Hinata POV. As was standard procedure on the battlefield, Hinata was stopped by the Anbu manning the barrier surrounding the hospital. My name is Yuga Hinata. I'm a Chunin level medic nin, here to transfer a patient for intensive care. Did you identify the patient? No, I could not. The Anbu nodded and stepped back to signal the others to temporarily grant them entry. When his head veered down towards the man's face. In any other situation, it would have been almost comical how far back the Anbu jumped. Ichiha Itachi. Hinata's pulse quickened and she connected the dots in an instant. That explained the strange sense of familiarity. Not only did the man resemble Sasuke, he was an infamous S-rank missing nin. At Hinata's medical orientation, he had been listed as a Category 5. Someone who all medic nin should flee at the sight of, regardless of whether any wounded remained on site. Three other Anbu had already appeared as backup, and Hinata knew if she let it go on much longer, she could very well be facing an entire platoon. Agents who'd be better spent out fighting on the field, instead of trying to arrest an already half-dead man. Please, I give my word as a medic that this man is in no condition to be a threat to anyone, said Hinata. The Chihad Itachi is a master of deception, the Anbu snapped. Stand down, medic. Hinata hesitated. Regardless of the man's identity or past, he was dying and needed immediate medical attention. However, be as it may, in the face of hierarchy, the opinion of Amir Chunin carried very little weight. She lowered the man's body to the ground, and in an instant the Anbu swarmed him. Naruto, POV When Naruto had last left his apartment, he had walked through a crowded, bustling marketplace, filled with the sounds of villagers going about their daily routine. Here and there, he'd attracted whispers and sometimes glares, and he'd caught bits and pieces of mundane conversations about everyday lives. Now, as he returned to his apartment, the way was silent, punctuated only by the occasional shouts of passing scouts and medics. The last of the fires had only just been put out, not a single part of the village was untouched. From what he'd overheard at the hospital, there were at least several hundred dead, mostly Chunin. While they had managed to capture some enemy ninja, it would take the intelligence division some time before they could extract any useful information. And by then, some worried, it would be too late. The outlook for the hidden leaf was grim. And at this time, when they needed strong leadership the most, the Hakage was dead. The situation couldn't have been any worse. Ironically enough, beyond the dark smoke still clouding the hidden leaf, the skies were clear and blue. It was a beautiful day. The way home had long been ingrained into Naruto's muscles. Step by step, he passed through the smoking ruin of the village. Even without the familiar landmarks to guide his way, it didn't take long for Naruto to find his apartment. Or, rather, what remained of it. A chunk from an adjacent building had crashed straight through it. The only thing left now was a pile of bricks. All of his possessions, few as they were. His books, his spare tanto. Were gone. He hadn't considered that his apartment would have been reduced to a pile of rubble. But, he supposed, there was no reason why it would have been spared. Sitting down on a lone slab of rock, Naruto rested his head on his knuckles. A breeze swept through the area, and he closed his eyes. His head, once full of an unending cycle of questions, felt clear at last. 
Naruto had never really understood why he, of all people, had been the fourth Hakage's son. Why he'd been made into a Jinchuriki, and why his teammates had died. Why, even now, he continued to live and breathe. But as it turned out, the answer he'd been searching for was something very simple. There was nothing Naruto could do about what had happened to him. He killed, sometimes because his mission required it, and at times unnecessarily. His teammates had been in the wrong place at the wrong time, and paid for it with their lives. Kakashi, too, should have died, but he had been fortunate enough that someone who could heal him had been there, in the right place, at the right time. Or maybe, it was because Naruto had once decided on a whim to help a starving girl. The bottom line was, there was no rhyme or reason to as to why things happened. There were only consequences. And whoever was left afterwards had no choice but to pick up after the rubble. It was a cruel and unfair world. Did it have to be that way? Opening his eyes, Naruto raised his gaze to the sky. The vast blue was starting to take on an orange sheen as the sun began to set. Tomorrow as well, the sun would rise and set. While the leaf may have been in mourning, the world would continue to move. Slowly, Naruto raised a hand to his chest. The void was still there, and perhaps it was true that nothing would ever be able to fill it up. But despite everything, Kakashi was alive. And at that moment, Naruto was glad to be, too. End of Chapter 41 Chapter 42 My Answer The once vibrantly lit Hidden Leaf Village had fallen into darkness. The gates were slammed shut, and Ninkin prowled the perimeter. A new sensing barrier had been erected around the ruined walls. Would-be visitors were turned away by border patrol, while exit permits were put on temporary hiatus. With the end of the invasion, news had quickly spread of the third Hokage's death, and the village entered lockdown mode. Within the village itself, uninjured Genin were instructed to guide newly homeless citizens toward shelters for aid, while able-bodied Chunin and Jonin were divided into squads and given direction to either assist in rebuilding or gathering intelligence. As the torture and interrogation force, led by the infamously scarred Ibiki, headed off to one block of the intelligence division's prison, members of the analysis team splintered off to various different sectors. Their leader, Yamanaka Inoichi, was curiously absent. His only daughter just died in the hospital, whispered one agent to another. Poison, I heard. None of the sand nin they interrogated knew what the antidote was. With that, they directed a nasty glare towards their cell's solitary inhabitant. A rusty-haired young man with dark-rimmed eyes. When the other cells were bursting to the seams with captives, his special treatment was due to the fact that he was the host of a tailed beast. However, while appropriate measures had been made to contain him if things got out of hand, Gara of the Hidden Sand had thus far been unexpectedly quiet in his shackles. In fact, he seemed to be spending most of his time meditating. The report said he killed his own sister, said the agent. I guess it's true what they say about these Jinchuriki. Makes you wonder why we don't just lock ours up. Shut up, warned his fellow agent, gesturing to the cell. Gara's eyes had opened, and he glowered at them now. Even with the bars of the cell separating the young man from the agents, they felt a shiver run down their backs. Don't go giving us that look now, said the agent with a scowl. You're only safe now while the top brass decides what to do with you. As had become the norm, Gara didn't respond. His face didn't move, if it weren't for the sheen of the light in his eyes, he would have looked like a corpse. Through the night, Gara continued to bite his time, thinking. Jurya POV Clouds filled the sky and hid the moon. It was a dark night, doubly so with the absence of the light that usually emanated from the village. The only lights now were that of the hospital and the torchlights of the sentries pacing the walls. While your average civilian may have balked, for Jurya, it was a more than welcome sight. Less people walking about and limited visibility simply made it easier than ever to leave without attracting unwanted attention. Especially when he'd had a hard enough time shaking the anbu on his tail as it was. Sending a shadow clone ahead to distract the nearest sentry, Jureya nimbly scaled the wall. Reaching the top, he stood still for a moment, listening to the wind. It was so dark, he couldn't even see the village rooftops anymore. Or at least, whatever remained of them. The village would be all right, he told himself. He'd done his duty. The village would suffer for a while, but it would be all right. It always was. I leave it to you. That had been the third's final words for Jureya. No doubt, he had wanted him to finally settle down as Hakage. However, Jureya thought that, with the fresh blood on his hands, he deserved a break. A long one, where he could write, drink, and enjoy a fair woman's company. Not necessarily in that order. And anyways, he would be a terrible Hakage, Jureya tried to reason with himself. 
He didn't belong in that tiny office, signing papers and ordering people around from afar. He needed to be out there on the field, gathering intelligence for the village, as he'd always done. He could just imagine the look on the third's face. Disappointed. Sorrowful. Still, Saratobi sensei would have understood. Goodbye, he said. The wind carried his voice away into the black night. In the distance, an Incan perked its ears and barked up at the wall. But there was no one there. Naruto, POV. As soon as Ichiraku Ramen came into view, Naruto let out an exhale. Somehow, mercifully, the building had been left more or less intact. Even if it had been destroyed, the popularity of the ramen stall ensured that it would have been rebuilt. Nonetheless, there was something reassuring about it, at the very least, having survived the invasion. However, as Naruto grew closer, he realized that the lights were off and that a sign had been placed outside, closed until further notice during morning period. Thank you for understanding. Cat got your tongue? Came an unfamiliar voice. Naruto blinked and looked to his right. It took a moment to place the source. A toad, perched just besides the sign, its pebbly skin blending right into the ground. It was holding a scroll in its tongue, which it offered up to Naruto as soon as he'd spotted it. After a moment's hesitation and a quick check to ensure that it wasn't booby-trapped, Naruto opened it to reveal a parchment filled with beautiful calligraphy. He instantly recognized the handwriting, it was Jiraiya's, and he knew in an instant what it meant. Jiraiya was leaving the village. While unfortunate for the leaf, it wasn't difficult to ascertain his reasons. As a jonin, Naruto had been allowed to read the full report. While stopping Gara had played a big role in ending the invasion, one of the other main players had been Jiraiya, who had finally slayed Orochimaru. Though Naruto didn't know the entire history behind the rift that had broken up the trio of sages, he knew how difficult the decision must have been for Jiraiya. Against all odds, Naruto had been hoping Jiraiya would stick around afterwards, but the sage wasn't called a hermit for nothing. From the sounds of it, however, the other ninja had been expecting Jiraiya to take up the Hakage position. The question was, with the man gone, who would step up to take the reins? The toad that had delivered Jiraiya's message had an interesting body composition. Its own middle section appeared to be made up of a scroll. No doubt, it was related to the other part of Jiraiya's letter. Once he'd committed the letter to memory, Naruto gestured towards the toad, which jumped towards his face. In a single leap, it wriggled into his mouth, and he swallowed it. Resisting the urge to throw it back up, Naruto wiped the slime from his lips. Suddenly, from the corner of his eye, he caught a glimpse of movement. Anbu? Were they following him? Acting as though he hadn't seen, Naruto moved on. However, now that he was aware that he was being tailed, he soon picked up on at two others within the vicinity that followed his every move. It seemed the time had come at last. He would have to confront that which he had been putting off for the past several years. His destiny. But unlike before, Naruto could feel resolve smoldering in his chest. Unlike before, he knew he was ready. Who are you? Someone who's going to change this world. Hinata POV Funerals were a terrible ordeal for everyone involved. While it was their chance to send off the deceased, it also made their absences feel all the more acute. The entire village had turned up for the massive event. Even the wounded had hobbled out in crutches and wheelchairs to pay their respects. There wasn't a single person who hadn't lost a family member or a friend. Hinata felt her heart tremble when she caught sight of Menma's pale face. His own face heavily bandaged, he'd come to find her, begging her to help Ino. Unfortunately, she had already been in her final death throes, the moment Hinata activated her Byakugan, she knew the poison had spread too far, shutting down all her systems. The most she could do for her former classmate had been to ease some of the pain before she succumbed to it entirely. Ino's teammates, Shikamaru and Choji, appeared to be at a loss for words. Ino wasn't the only familiar face staring down at her from the wall of the deceased. Her old teammate, Kiba, and her academy teacher, Aruka, had also been killed in action. When Hinata saw Akamaru at the edge of the crowd, his ears and tail drooping, she took him into her arms and finally began to cry. Sai POV The orders from above had been abrupt and to the point, keep the Jinchuriki, Yuzumaki Naruto, under constant surveillance. Avoid detection at all costs. Do not engage in combat. Target is a trained sage. If Target tries to leave the village, alert the Hakage immediately. Fortunately, their target appeared to be suffering from chakra exhaustion, aside from visiting a jonin in the hospital, he spent most of his time sleeping. Oddly enough, while most of his colleagues made use of the relief shelters, the target seemed to prefer sleeping outside. 
That, however, was the only notable observation made after two full days of surveillance. Though his two fellow root operatives didn't seem overly concerned, Sai knew better than to lower his guard. Though he hadn't interacted with the target since their mission to wave country, the target had left a more than lasting impression. Of course, he kept such thoughts to himself. That was why, on the dawn of the third day, when Sai suddenly realized he couldn't reach the other two root members, he wasn't too surprised to feel a cold blade suddenly press itself to the back of his neck. Why am I being followed? Said his target into his ear. You know why, was his only response. A pause. Where are they holding the captives from grass country? Sai thought about it, and then told him. Idly, as he waited for the finishing blow, he thought about the picture book he'd never managed to finish. Instead of a searing pain across his neck, however, he felt something hard hit his head. Bright circles filled his field of vision. And then nothing. Kakashi POV As Kakashi left the hospital, he thought he could count himself among the more fortunate ones. While he may have been missing an eye, not only did he still have all four limbs attached, but they were also fully functioning. Others. Some being forcefully discharged by the looks of it, to make room for incoming wounded were not so well off. Even with medical ninjutsu on hand, there was a limit to what their medics could heal. More often than not, the grim expressions of the discharged indicated a long and laborious recovery, if not outright early retirement. A man with a bowl cut was waiting for Kakashi outside the hospital. 4848, said the man. He reached out and gripped Kakashi tightly by the shoulder. It had been several months since Kakashi had last seen Mike Guy and his team, who had been sent out on a long-term mission. Your team? Guy inquired. I didn't see their names, but. Safe, said Kakashi. Your team? Guy nodded. We're fine. We came back as soon as we heard the news. He shook his head, his face grim. I can't help but think, if we were here when it happened. The Lord Third considered your case, and made the decision to prioritize your team's mission, said Kakashi. He didn't expect the village to be overrun like this. Nobody did. Looking around, Guy drew to the corner, and Kakashi followed. In a low voice, Guy murmured, I just don't understand. The sensing barrier, our agents on the perimeter. How did something this big get past us? The working theory right now is that the enemy planted sleeper agents among us. Guy exhaled. Hence the village being shut down. While it's unfortunate, I see why it's a necessary measure. Still. About the third successor. I can't believe it. Kakashi arched an eyebrow. What do you mean? Meanwhile in prison. His footsteps sounded quietly through the hallway, attracting the guard's notice. At the sight of his face, the guard jumped to attention. Sir. You're back. I didn't get the notice, I thought you were supposed to be out until tomorrow. Keeping his face stern, he waved the guard off. In this time of great need, I cannot vacate my post any longer. Of course sir. If you could just show your identification. Fixing the guard with a cool stare, he replied, enough. There is no time to waste. I need to examine the captive. Alone. The guard gulped. He was new to this station, but he'd heard the rumors about the analysis team's leader. Though outwardly he didn't strike as imposing a figure as Ibiki, Yamanaka Inoichi's skills in analysis and interrogation were an invaluable asset to the village. Yes, sir, said the guard, hastily unlocking the door. Unbeknownst to him, as Yamanaka Inoichi walked past, he let go of a kunai hidden in his waist holster. He knew exactly where to go, expertly navigating the maze of corridors. When he finally came to a stop, he stood in front of a lone cell holding a single captive. A young female with crimson hair eagerly pressed her face against the bars, her hands and feet otherwise bound in chains. Naruto, she exclaimed in delight. Without releasing his henjit, Naruto nodded. Of course Karen would be able to see through his disguise. Her sensory skills were truly on a different level from anyone he'd ever met before. I'm sorry I couldn't come earlier, he said, holding his hands behind his back. But at the moment, all foreign ninja are being held for questioning. I told them everything I know, Karen replied instantly. Which wasn't much. So the hidden grass wasn't a part of the invasion? Karen shook her head. No. At least, not that I know of. And you don't know anything about the Akatsuki? With a look of regret, Karen shook her head again. No. I'm sorry. Nobody will believe me, but it's true. Naruto nodded. At the very least, he believed her. With her actions on the battlefield, she had proved herself more than trustworthy. I wanted to thank you for saving my teacher. I owe you a big debt. To his surprise, Karen's eyes filled with tears. That's the first time anyone's ever thanked me. That gave Naruto some pause. 
While he knew now how gifted the girl from grass country was, he knew next to nothing about her background or her past. But, he thought, he wanted to learn. He wanted to learn more about Karen, about Gara, about the other Jinjiriki. He wanted to know more about the world. This time, not from his own lonely perspective, but from the perspective of others. Shouts began to sound a distance away, echoing through the empty halls. Had they finally discovered his ruse? You have to leave, said Karen, her tone frightened. They're coming. Not for me. For you. I know, he replied. Everything was so clear to Naruto now. If his journey with Jiraiya had taught Naruto anything, it was that the world was large and filled with possibilities. If Kakashi's survival had shown him anything, it was that life was fleeting. After years of searching, he knew now what he wanted. This system of sealing tailed beasts into innocence and forcing Jinchuriki to act under the village's bidding. The world of Shinobi, where figures lurked in the shadows and involved innocence in their struggle for power. This world in which his teammates had perished, in which his teachers suffered daily from guilt and despair. We endure. Naruto had had enough of it. Who are you? Someone who's going to change the world. That was what the masked man had said. But in Naruto's opinion, a world created by such a man would be no better than the current one. And as much as he had once resented being made the host of the Nine Tails, he knew now that it gave him the ability to make a difference. Naruto extended a hand towards Karen. I'm going to destroy this world. Will you join me? Without any hesitation, Karen reached through the bars and took his hand. Somewhere else. Deep underground, a lone man kneeled in an isolated cell. While he was already practically blind, he had been blindfolded, with a seal written on the cloth, and each limb was bound in chains. The cell had just enough space for the man to lie down comfortably. The thick concrete walls had no doors or windows and was further surrounded by two barriers, each manned by four anbu that alternated on 12-hour shifts. This was just a security visible to the naked eye, numerous hidden seals further surrounded the perimeter, a last failsafe in the case of a catastrophe. Even with such a system in place, the anbu appeared visibly on edge. They all knew the history of the man they were guarding, knew he could kill them all in the blink of an eye if he somehow managed to escape. Oddly enough, the man in question seemed perfectly content to remain in his cell. Indeed, several nights worth of food and rest appeared to have restored some color to his gone cheeks. A long shadow extended along the corridor. Silently, an older man stepped in front of the cell. He was accompanied by two Anbu. Curiously, the Anbu captain currently standing guard had never seen either of their masks before. Lower the barrier, commanded the man. The captain nodded. Yes, Hakage-sama. Standing back, he signaled to his men. The flames of the first barrier flickered, lighting up a stern face swathed in bandages. Then it faded away, plunging the cell into darkness. End of chapter 42 Chapter 43 A World That Was Transparent Blood-red Sharingan eyes peered out from the holes of the Anbu mask. Dead leaves blew in the unnatural wind sweeping through the deserted Achiha complex. I witnessed everything and I will continue to watch. If you so much as lay a hand on Sasuke, I will pass on classified village intel to every enemy nation. Leaving those last words, the man's cloaked frame suddenly swelled up and burst into ravens that flew away. An eerie, echoing caw filled the void. Damn you. Far from the scene that had once left Danzo in the humiliating position of being berated like an unruly academy child, he regarded the bound figure before him with burgeoning relief. On the tail end of disaster, one of the biggest threats to the hidden leaf had at last been neutralized. This is what has become of the great Ichiha Itachi, Danzo said, not bothering to disguise his distaste. At the sound of his voice, his prisoner raised his head. Despite the fact that he was blindfolded, the rude agents at Danzo's back immediately drew their weapons. It was a pointless endeavor, the prison was virtually impossible to escape. Still, when nothing appeared to be separating Danzo and his agents from the infamous Ichiha, he would not blame them for being on edge. However, the Achiha Itachi who had once left Danzo with a threat was no more. The man before him, shackled and bound, was a mere shadow of his previous self. Disease-ridden, from the looks of it, doubtless, a final hereditary gift from his inbreeding ancestors. At last, Danzo addressed him. My agents tell me you have something to say to me? My words are for the Hakage's ears only, responded Itachi, his voice hoarse and weak. The Lord Third is busy enough as it is, Danzo lied smoothly. Whatever you tell me will be conveyed to him. The beat passed. So the Hakage has passed, as I feared. Danzo felt his eyebrows rise. What leads you to that conclusion? 
The barriers imprisoning Itachi had sealed off all sound as well, effectively leaving him in isolation. Ichiha Itachi had always been famed for his genius, and the less information that reached the man, the better. I made enough of a public ruckus to ensure that news of my return would reach his ears. The fact that he isn't here can only mean he is either incapacitated or dead. Given the circumstances surrounding this village, I would assume the latter. Danzo scoffed, it seemed his efforts had been in vain. You Ichiha were always too clever for your own good. He spread his hands open. It is of little matter. Speak now, or take your secrets to the grave. Beneath the blindfold, Itachi's lips quirked back in what could have been mistaken for a smile in the dim light. Yes. I suppose it doesn't matter anymore. I came here to deliver information regarding Akatsuki and its leader. Its true leader. Meanwhile in prison. Shouts sounded and the torch lights on the walls flickered. Naruto could sense several bodies rapidly descending upon them. With only one viable exit, they made no effort to hide their approach. Turning his gaze back to Karen, Naruto stepped back, drew his tanto, and cut through the bars of the cell. Though he wasn't familiar with the necessary fuinjutsu to free Karen of her sealed restraints without hurting her, she would at least be able to move around, letting him concentrate on the coming battle. Naruto, Karen, you search for Gara, he said. I'll take care of this. The words had just barely left his mouth when metal glinted, followed by swift movement. His pursuers were upon them already. As they came into view, the white animal masks of the Anbu hid their faces. Naruto remembered years ago, when they had last come for him. They had scooped him up, struggling, and dumped him unceremoniously in the Hakage's office, where he had learned he would become a ninja. Though he had feared them at first, they had been his allies. Lightning crackled. Naruto dispatched the first two who reached him with two swings of his tanto. The third met a similar fate. But just as the metal plunged into his chest, the man squeezed his muscles, trapping the blade. Without pause, Naruto released the hilt and pierced through the fourth Anbu's chest with a chakra-reinforced hand. As he ripped his bloodied hand out, the fifth brushed him. And a current of lightning chakra surged through Naruto, passing to the man and frying him on the spot. The stink of singed flesh fouled the air, and the last Anbu's mask slipped off with a clatter, revealing a middle-aged man with nondescript features. For some reason, the Anbu always seemed strangely vulnerable once unmasked. Something metallic on his forehead gleamed in the torchlight. Despite himself, Naruto stared, struck by the realization that it was his first time killing a ninja that wore the same hit I ate as himself. There had been too many of them, and too little time, to have mercy, and his old self would have done it without a second thought. But suddenly, the face of the nameless leaf agent he'd discovered dead in the safe house with Hinata flashed through his mind, and Naruto wondered if they had ever crossed paths before. If they had ever sat in his usual stool at Ichiraku for a bowl of miso ramen. I've found Gara, Karen announced, her nose wrinkling at the smell. Naruto straightened up, his gaze lingering on the face of the Anbu. Naruto? Tearing his eyes away, he motioned for her to lead. Let's go. There really was no turning back now but he had already known this when he had made his decision. The way ahead was clear, his heart was steady. Gara POV Gara couldn't sleep. At least, not for long. Mother lurking just beyond the horizon of unconsciousness ensured that. And now, he couldn't even close his eyes. Not without seeing a sandy-haired figure staring back at him accusingly. Gara, stop. Not without hearing her last words ringing in his head. Something in his chest throbbed. Why had he lashed out then? Gara couldn't stop replaying the scene in his head. Over the years, as freely as he'd killed, he'd always made sure to not lay a hand on his siblings. But why? What made them so special? There was a voice whispering in Gara's head. It wasn't Mother's voice. It was something much quieter. It sounded like his own voice, and he didn't know what to make of it. Gara. Metal clinked as his hands jerked up against his chains to try and block his ears but he couldn't bring them close enough, and the chain groaned against his pulling. Stop that immediately, demanded his guard, banging on the bars of his cell with a baton. Gara, stop. His chains clinked. Once again, to no avail. Gara, you stop, he replied hoarsely. We're here to get you out of here. Startled, Gara looked up. The guard's face was frozen, and behind the man, Gara saw two faces staring back at him. One was a girl with bright red hair, and the other was the leaf nin who had managed to defeat him. Unlike the girl who eyed Gara with a familiar expression of revulsion and fear, the latter wore an oddly inquisitive look on his face. As Gara watched, the guard crumpled to the ground, and an oppressive feeling lifted from his shoulders. 
The barrier that had been containing his cell faded away, it seemed the rest had been similarly dispatched. Gara focused on the Leaf Nin. Why are you helping me? The Leaf Nin stepped closer, wrapping a hand around the bars. I'm Uzumaki Naruto. I'm a Jinchuriki, just like you. A Jinchuriki. While the word was new to Gara's tongue, he was no stranger to its meaning. He had known for a long time now that there were others like him, though this was his first time coming face to face with one. However, the Leaf Nin was wrong in saying that he was just like Gara. One look at the girl besides him, and he could tell. You're nothing like me, he said. They'd taken his gourd of sand, but far beneath them, Gara could feel the bedrock trembling. The Leaf Nin raised his brows, and the girl besides him frowned. We don't need him, Naruto. He's unstable. He'll only slow you down. She was the one who had used those chains on him before, Gara realized with a body-racking shudder. The red from the pool of blood around the fallen guard was seeping into his vision, and the voices in his head were growing louder. Blood. Gara. Crack. The ground at his feet began to splinter. The leaf nin stepped away from the bars. I'm not here to fight you, or to win your trust. Kill them both. Gara. Stop. If you're going to escape, go now, before backup arrives. Before they can kill us, kill them both. Stop. Stop. The whole world was almost covered in the red haze now, and Gara felt something in his chest coiling so tightly, it burned him from the inside out. The voices in his head, the aching in his heart. It was too much. He just wanted to be alone. But it was too late. Gara could feel the beast inside of him surging up again. His head felt like it was splitting. Get away from me, he managed to grit out, before I kill you, too. Suddenly, something hard hit the back of his neck, and he felt his eyes roll back from the impact. The world quickly turned black. The last thing he realized before he lost consciousness was the face of the Leaf Nin looming over him. And the sound of chains clinking in the darkness. Danzo, POV. Ichiha Madara? Danzo echoed in disbelief. Impossible. That is the name the man goes by, said Itachi. I have never seen his face. But I have witnessed his power, and he is a real threat to the Hidden Leaf. As well as to the rest of the world. Danzo's sharp gaze raked over his prisoner. You have gone mad. Mad? Itachi began to cough, spraying the ground with dark specks of blood. Once he had finished, his lips pushed up into a thin smile. Perhaps. But you and I both know that I speak the truth. After all, you have your own network of spies. Through their eyes, you have seen how quickly Akatsuki's influence has spread. Ichiha Madara was known for many things, but immortality was not one of them, Danzo stated evenly. He steepled his fingers together. Still, I will play your game for now. Let us say that Ichiha Madara somehow fooled the first Hakage and escaped death. What is his plan for the Jinchuriki? Most of the other members of Akatsuki are following the man calling himself Pain. They are not even aware of Madara's role as puppet master. They believe they will use the Jinchuriki to threaten the world into a time of peace. However, I believe Madara's true plan to be much more sinister than Pain's. A shadow came over Itachi's expression. That man does not have nearly as much faith in mankind. Danzo opened his mouth to respond. When a flurry of motion interrupted him. One of his subordinates suddenly appeared, his head bowed in deference. I gave orders to be left alone, he said coldly. My apologies, Hakage-sama, said his agent. But both of the Jinchuriki have escaped. Hinata POV the hospital had run out of space, and they had hastily set up two medical tents in its periphery. The sound of groans was deafening, the smell of infection thickened the air. Hinata had been awake for the last 43. No, 49 hours now, and her chakra levels had never been so low. She'd long since passed a maximum advised dosage of chakra pills. Somehow, they were still finding wounded throughout the village, though the surging flow had finally slowed down to a steady trickle over the past day. Except for the short break of the funeral, Hinata had worked non-stop since the end of the invasion. She had been able to save many, though a handful had been beyond any help. They're bringing in another one. Cried a voice. The medic working in the bay besides Hinata grumbled, great. Another half-dead Chunin. Hinata returned her focus to her current patient. Or trying to. The floor was starting to sway beneath her feet, like a fishing boat at sea. Soon, her team leader's voice came floating from somewhere nearby. Hinata, can you take the next patient? My bays are all full. After that one, you can take a break. Yes, of course, I'm almost done, Hinata replied automatically. The needle she was pulling through the patient's scalp shook in her hand. This man needs to be seen immediately, said a new male voice. He's lost too much blood. Holding back a sigh, Hinata looked up. 
and froze. Dark hair, pale skin. For a moment, she thought she was once again looking into the face of Ichiha Itachi, no doubt back for vengeance. But then the floor steadied and the moment passed, and she realized the young man standing before her was a little too young and much too healthy for that to be the case. Sasuke. She started, before stopping herself. At the sound of his name, his dark eyes shot up to her in belated recognition. Hinata. I didn't realize that was you. As tired as she was, Hinata didn't miss the way he'd stumbled over her name, nor did it surprise her. She'd always been a wallflower in the academy, after all. The bigger issue was that when Hinata had turned over Ichiha Itachi to the Anbu at the hospital, they had warned her not to inform anyone of the fugitive's presence. Now, she had to wonder, did that warning extend to the only other living Ichiha in the village? Memories The blood-red Sharingan eye peered out alone from under a leaf Hitai 8, dark blood streamed down the other side of the man's face. I tried using Kodamatsukami to stop the coup dead it, but Danzo stole my right eye. He doesn't trust me. He intends to protect the village on his own, by any and all means. Before that happens, let me give it to you. Shisui. Without any hesitation, the man's fingers plunged into his eye socket. You, my best friend, are the only one I can count on. Protect this village. And the Achiha name. Itachi POV. The urgent news brought to Danzo, and his resultant shock, was the disruption Itachi had been waiting for. He had returned to the village fully expecting to be imprisoned. Now, with the barriers lowered and Danzo distracted, it was time for him to make his last move. Danzo had been wasting his time sealing Itachi's eyes when he was already well and truly blind. It was the price he had willingly paid to use his man Gekyo over the years. That, and the sickness that had ravaged his body, was his punishment for his sins. A punishment far lighter than the one he deserved. Itachi felt his throat swell up and something soft brushed his palate and then it was gone, expelled into the open air. He could see it in his mind's eye, a crow, with Shisui's last legacy glistening in its black feathers. What? Danzo's voice began in alarm. You will love and serve not only the Hidden Leaf Village, but all of its people as well, Itachi commanded. To your dying breath, you will live by the will of fire. The crow squawked, and as the room fell silent, Itachi knew it had worked. At last, he thought. Shisui's sacrifice hadn't all been for naught. Through the intense relief, the clock that had temporarily been frozen began to tick once more. His lungs burning up, Itachi began to cough, and the dark world around him started to spin. With another stab of pain, he felt the last of his muscles give way, and he collapsed onto the cold floor. Kakashi POV The village was bathed in red and orange from the sun when Kakashi first heard the news. His time in the Anbu had left him with a pair of eyes and ears in every sector of the village, and it had paid off time and time again. This time was no different, the shrill cries of cicadas surged in the hot temperature as a voice whispered in his ear. His mouth turned dry. With the third gun, Kakashi had expected changes. When Danzo was announced as the successor, he'd braced himself for changes. But this? This was too sudden, too drastic. Naruto had broken out two prisoners and killed over a dozen leaf agents in the process? Kakashi shook his head. There has to be an explanation. This makes no sense. He wouldn't do that without good reason. Tell that to the bodies I saw left behind, said the agent darkly. No word from the Hakage yet. Though with this, I reckon it's going to be a kill on sight. In the distance, a loud siren began to sound. A flock of birds burst out of the nearby trees. With a salute, the agent left, leaving Kakashi alone with his increasingly frantic thoughts. Pacing back and forth, he raised a hand to his chin and then lowered it. He looked up at the sky and then back down at the ground. He stopped. He exhaled. Then, he bit into his thumb. Summoning technique. In a cloud of smoke, several Ninkan dogs appeared. At its head, a disgruntled-looking pug looked up at him in alarm. What's the matter, Kakashi? I need you all to find Naruto, he said. Now. For once, Pakan didn't protest at Kakashi's tone of voice, leaping immediately to action. The Ninkan began to sniff the ground, and Kakashi was suddenly struck with the realization that he had no idea what to say if he were to confront his student. He's using clones to throw off his scent, said Pakin grimly. It'll take some time to narrow down the real one. Kakashi stopped his pacing. Of course Naruto would have had the foresight to confuse the Ninkan. He wouldn't have expected any less of his student. Suddenly, Kakashi knew exactly where Naruto wanted him to be. Change of plans. Update the rest of my team on the situation, he instructed Pakan. Tell them they are not, in any circumstance, to try and chase down Naruto. 
Roger that. As Packin began to swiftly race towards the village walls, Kakashi headed the other way. The majority of the villagers appeared to have no idea what was going on. Even with the village in near ruin, it seemed daily life had to press onwards. Hey Kakashi. Guy just barely managed to get out before Kakashi passed him. The training ground soon came into view before passing. Another field came into view. This time, filled with rows of white tombstones. In the distance, a lone red-headed figure waited for him. As Kakashi drew closer, the figure turned around. Sensei. You came. Naruto seemed calmer than he would have expected of a newly minted fugitive on the run. But then again, it was Naruto. You're a clone, aren't you? Yes. And you're leaving? Yes. Is it true that you killed multiple leaf agents? Naruto inclined his head. They were coming after me under Danzo's orders. Kakashi sighed, his body suddenly heavy. What a mess. Even though he had always known that the third Hakage had been the benefactor of Naruto's freedom, he hadn't expected his successor to spearhead the very opposite philosophy. It wasn't that he couldn't understand Danzo's fears, however. The thought of a Jinchuriki as powerful as Naruto running around freely would surely have made anyone break out into a sweat. His face as unreadable as ever, Naruto rested his hand on a tombstone. The light illuminated the characters carved into the smooth stone face. Hagen Rai. And for a moment, the two of them silently regarded each other. Then, Naruto spoke. Sensei, you told me once that as ninja, we have to endure. What did you mean by that? In an instant, Kakashi remembered exactly what he was referring to. When his teammates had died and Naruto had lost control over the Nine Tails, Kakashi had been frantic at the time. It seemed Naruto had taken his words to heart. We're often not as alone as we think we are, Naruto. Naruto slowly nodded. So come with me, sensei. With Danzo as Hakage, this isn't the same hidden leaf anymore. I know you must be as tired of this system, of this world, as I am. Together, we can do something about it. The cicada's cries were louder than usual that day, or perhaps Kakashi just hadn't been listening before. Though the trees that they usually clung to were on the far end of the cemetery, their cries seemed about to swallow them. A memory, a shade flickered before Kakashi, a young boy, sitting apart from his two teammates, spoke up out of the blue. I'm Uzumaki Naruto. I plan on becoming the next Hakage. Did you know, Naruto? He began. I was assigned to Kashina-san's guard when she was pregnant with you. The last time I ever saw her or Minato-sensei again was the day before the Nine Tails attacked. Watching the two squabble back and forth, Kakashi chortled. You all rather remind me of my own team back in the day. Curiosity filling his expression, Naruto looked up at him. What was your team like, sensei? My teammate, Abito, died saving me. My other teammate, Rin, died at my hands. His face pinched with dismay, Naruto spread his arms wide open. Even Mayu and Rai would turn their backs on me if they knew, and you know it. Kakashi paused. I haven't turned my back on you. You're different, sensei. When I was young, my father returned from a mission in disgrace. It was too much for him to bear. And soon afterwards, he took his own life. His face contorted, Naruto clutched his chest. How do you deal with it, sensei? Kakashi inclined his head. We endure. What I'm trying to say is. What you say is true, Kakashi admitted. Through this terrible world, I've lost almost everyone I love. Then you'll come with me? Kakashi stopped. And for a long moment, he considered it. But he already knew the answer in his heart. How had they come to this moment? When had their paths first began to diverge? Those years ago, during the Chunin exams in Wind Country, when Naruto had been reeling from the side effects of the taboo seal. Had Kakashi been wrong to tell him the truth? His heart heavy with regret, Kakashi shook his head. The hidden leaf needs me, now more than ever. As expected, Naruto didn't respond. The setting sun cast his shadow, dark and jagged, across the face of another tombstone. Kamazuki Mayu. While Kakashi didn't know what Naruto's plans were, from the look of newfound conviction in his eyes, it had to be something beyond anything he could think of. And it would be dangerous. Kakashi thought of how Naruto had appeared, panicked, on the battlefield to save them, and he felt a pang. As much faith as Kakashi had in his students' capabilities, as much as Naruto was a Jinchuriki. He was not indestructible. Nobody was. A word of advice for you, Naruto. Your mother and her Jinchuriki predecessor were both Uzumaki, and they both used chains to control the Nine Tails. Not unlike that Karen girl. That drew a look of faint surprise from Naruto. Karen? After the hidden whirlpool was destroyed, most of the survivors moved to the hidden leaf. Most, but not all. I wouldn't be surprised if Karen is one of their descendants. I'll keep that in mind. Straightening, Naruto looked at Kakashi squarely. I'm glad we were able to visit their graves together. 
It struck Kakashi that they were now the exact same height. We'll meet again, he said. After all, I owe you a rematch. I hope so, came the response. Goodbye, sensei. There was a note of finality to Naruto's tone, as though he had looked into the future and predetermined their fates. Their divergent paths. Where would they lead? Take care, Naruto, said Kakashi. With one last lingering look down at the graves, Naruto's clone disappeared in a gust of wind, and Kakashi suddenly found himself alone. The sirens from the village were growing louder, as the sound mixed with the shrill screams of cicadas in his ears, he realized something. That not even for a moment had he considered stopping Naruto. Itachi POV pause equals 1500. He didn't know how much time had passed when the bindings that had weighed heavily on his limbs seemed to fade away, as if doused in water, his burning body grew cold. And then all of a sudden, he found himself floating in a pitch black world. All the pain was gone. For the first time in a long time, it no longer hurt. Was this death? If so, he welcomed it. He had long since prepared himself for this moment. He had passed on all the information he had. He had completed his duty, heedless of the sacrifices laid in its wake. That had always been his greatest flaw, he thought. He could only ever see the forest and not the trees, and maybe in that aspect, he wasn't as different from his enemies as he would have liked. He did have just a one regret. Time. If only he had had just a little more of it, if only he had spent just a little less time training, and a little more with his family. But there was nothing he could do about it now. Sorry Sasuke. Maybe next time. End of chapter 43. Chapter 44. Silhouette. The sun had set, and the night was deep. A flock of birds circled the skies, their wings cutting through the air in serene silence. A sharp contrast to the current events unfolding on the ground far below. Alarms sounded from the hidden leaf, echoing through the trees outside its walls. Packs of Ninkans sniffed the forest floor, leading masked Anbu in every direction away from the village. A distance away, a lone blonde woman hurtled through a dark, grassy plain, leaving behind a trail of flickering blue flames that erased her footprints. Further north, the hidden cloud had fallen silent. Its infamous clouds had retreated from the mountain range, and the smell of decay had begun to envelope the once-renowned village. To the far west, smoke rose from the turrets encircling the hidden rock. Dark-eyed golems towered above its walls, and drums beat steadily as every citizen, from child to elder, gathered in the village center to listen to their leader. Southwards, a team of sand nin led by a hooded puppeteer, raced urgently through the moonlit dunes of their home. Finally, to the east, in a cave hidden by fog, a number of shadowy figures surrounded a mutilated body, drawing out the last of the chakra contained within. All this, the birds witnessed from above. As a low-hanging cloud passed by, the flock simultaneously tipped to the side, revealing a multitude of glowing, ringed eyes. Then, with another flap of their wings, the night swallowed them. Naruto, POV. Thanks to Naruto's clones distracting the Hidden Leaf's hunting parties, they had put enough distance between themselves and the village that they had stopped for a break. Gara had yet to emerge from his unconscious state, and Karen was asleep, presumably exhausted from the prolonged use of her chains. Awash in the moonlight, Naruto sat wide awake, though he was far from being alone. The forest was alive with the shuffling and scuttling of creatures carrying about their nightly routine. A large spider web spanned a tree a stone's throw away from where Naruto sat, its strands illuminated one moment before fading into darkness the next. An insect had gotten itself stuck on the web, as it squirmed, a bulbous black spider suddenly shot out and rolled it up into a knot. Naruto closed his eyes, and the world faded around him, leaving him sitting in a pitch black space. However, here, too, he was not alone. A multitude of faces surrounded him, silent and pale. They were there because each one of them had unwittingly left a piece of themselves within him. It must have been because it was all in his mind, but for once, the words he really meant to say spilled easily from his lips. Iruka sensei he greeted the first one, a chunin with a scar running across his face. I never had the chance to thank you for what you did. After the invasion of the Hidden Leaf, Naruto had seen Iruka's name on the list of the deceased. The name had brought with it a flash of nostalgia. When Naruto had been struggling to improve in the academy, Aruka had discreetly directed him to the archive library. Though at the time, he hadn't realized the man's intent. You've abandoned the village, Aruka's voice rang hollowly in the darkness. Where will you go now? Somewhere I can rally my defenses. Right now, his first priority was in leaving behind fire country and securing a position away from his pursuers. Next to Aruka stood a dark-skinned girl with spiky hair that Naruto recognized immediately. 
the Jinchuriki from the hidden waterfall, Fu. One of the many killed by Akatsuki. Naruto had heard she had been taken on her way back from the Chunin exams. You didn't deserve what happened to you, he said. I wish I could have saved you. Her orange eyes arched mockingly. What can you do? I have the nine tails. I can make a difference. Besides Fu, a thin freckled woman stared at him. Her name was Kane, and she had once hired Naruto and his team for their fateful mission in Wave Country. The last he had heard of her was that she had succumbed to the wounds inflicted on her during the interrogation. My team died because of you, said Naruto. But I understand you believed your actions would bring peace. Is it even possible? She whispered. Can this cycle be ended? I don't know. But I have to try. Standing a ways back, an older woman with strands of white mixed in with her brown hair looked off into the darkness. Her expression was stern and guarded, her hands folded neatly on her lap. Even though Naruto hadn't seen her since he was a young child, he recognized her immediately. To the woman who had once been his caretaker. The woman who had been his teammate's mother. He said, I'm sorry I couldn't protect you or Maeve. I'm going to do what I can from now on to make sure something like that doesn't happen again. With her body still angled away from Naruto, the dark pupils of his ex-caretaker's eyes slowly shifted back until they met his own. Then first, you must decide. Who is your enemy? Naruto opened his eyes. The clouds shifted, and a ray of light fell across the spider web. The spider scuttled away, retreating into the shadows, and the light extended to Naruto's face. On the other side of their camp, Karen stirred and opened her eyes. Pushing herself up on her hands, she put her glasses back on and turned to him. Naruto? Is something wrong? No, I wouldn't say that. Karen fidgeted under his gaze, a faint blush tinting her cheeks. Then why are you staring? Who is your enemy? I wanted to ask you. Why did you take my hand? The look of surprise lifting her chin, Karen blinked rapidly. Because. You held your hand out to me, I guess. Why do you ask? Who is your enemy? What if I were to tell you that by following me, we were almost guaranteed to be killed? Karen's blush faded from her face, and after a moment, she sat up straight. Not if I can do something about it. Naruto looked down. You may not be able to. I'm a missing nin now. So not only do we have to worry about Akatsuki, but bounty hunters from my village will be trying to chase us down. He paused. If you're having second thoughts, I won't stop you from leaving. The beat passed, and for a moment, Naruto felt his breath catch in his throat. Then Karen replied, No. I made my decision as well, Naruto, to be on your side. Your enemies are my enemies now. This time, it was Naruto's turn to blink. Looking back up, he saw that even in the moonlight, Karen's hair was a fiery red. Her expression blazed equally fiercely back at him, and he thought. If they really were both Yuzumaki, they were quite different. Yet somehow, they were both here in this place, at this very moment. Naruto felt the corners of his lips tug back in a smile, a motion that brought with it a lulling sense of warmth. And just a little bit of sadness. Karen's life had not been kind to her, he thought, to have led her to him. Thank you, he said. Haku, POV. It was cold. Snow drifted down from the sky, covering the bridge in white and melting away where it touched his bare skin. The cold wind brushed against him. He shivered, but he had nowhere to go. He was all alone. The snow continued to drift by. Slowly, serenely. Suddenly, a dark shadow fell on him, and he looked up. There was a tall man there. A ninja. Bandages covered most of his face, leaving just a pair of dark eyes. At the sight, he immediately clambered to his feet, reaching for the man. I did it, he said, his voice high and childlike. I killed Kakashi of the Sharingan. I finally avenged you. But the dark eyes only stared down at him in cold ambivalence. Who the hell are you? The words were a slap to his face, and he froze. Suddenly, he saw his raised hand, the one good hand he had left. There was something dark red on it. It was blood, he realized, and it was spreading. He watched in horror as it rapidly surged from his fingertips, to his wrist, to his arm, his shoulder. Then it was in his neck, and suddenly he couldn't breathe anymore, it was strangling him, suffocating him, and the entire world was beginning to turn red. Haku's eyes flew open and he sat up, a silent scream splitting his lips. His heart was pounding in its ribcage, his skin cold with sweat. He looked around at his surroundings wildly, searching. But the world was no longer red. It was not snowing, either. It was dark, and the air was heavy with humidity. Haku? A high voice cut in. Are you okay? Letting out a rattling exhale, Haku closed his eyes, clearing his thoughts and collecting himself. Yes, I'm all right. 
since leaving the Hidden Leaf with their mysterious new ally, they had taken a roundabout route in order to throw off any possible pursuers. So far, however, they had been left alone. Her gaze still searching him suspiciously, his teammate Ajisai frowned. If you say so. At the sight of her face, Haku felt his stomach twist guiltily. She had declined Kabuto's offer to heal her broken nose with medical ninjutsu, and the swelling was only now starting to gone down. Speaking of which, Haku and Ajisai seemed to be the only ones around. Where did Kabuto go? He said he was going to scout the area. Something about searching for the hidden pathway. Haku raised an eyebrow. The hidden pathway? Can we really trust him? Who's to say he isn't just leading us into a trap? For some reason, Ajisai seemed perturbed by his words, her eyes flickering uneasily away from him. If he was going to do that, he would have done it while we were still in enemy territory. I hope you're right. Ajisai hesitated and then said quietly, if only Surin was here, we'd know for sure. Suddenly, she grew very still. He's coming back. Ajisai had discreetly placed a tracker on their mysterious guide near the beginning of their journey, and they had been careful to talk only when Kabuto was outside of hearing range. The bushes in front of them parted, and Kabuto strode into the clearing. As Ajisai surged forward to address him, Haku hung back. Now that he'd regained some semblance of control over himself, it felt strange being there. He'd never thought about what he would do after he had gotten his revenge for Zabuza. Ever since that red-headed leaf nin had spared him in wave country, Haku had considered himself a dead man living on borrowed time. When the man with the snake had marked him, he'd thought his luck had finally ran out. And yet, against all odds, he was still here. A mercenary from the Hidden Mist, masquerading as an agent of the Hidden Rain. The guide's going to be meeting us, said Kabuto. They'll be taking us the rest of the way to meet your leaders. Ajisai's eyes lit up. Lady Angel? As his teammate's frame visibly loosened up, to his surprise, a sense of relief also washed through Haku. Followed shortly by a stab of revulsion. It seemed his years of pretending to be an aim nin hadn't quite left him untouched by the Akatsuki's brainwashing. Still, Zabuza had once worked for Akatsuki before meeting his demise. Haku raised a hand to his covered shoulder. At some point since they had left the village, the seal on his body had almost completely disappeared. The little he knew about Fuinjutsu told him that it was possible that the man who'd put the seal on him had died. Likely, he had been killed in the raging battle at the Hidden Leaf. But somehow, Haku didn't think that was quite the case, as he could still feel a tiny presence on his shoulder. Though much smaller than it had been, it was still there, darkly pulsating. What could it mean? Sasuke, POV Sasuke's team was in shambles. There was really no better word to describe it. Immediately following Naruto's escape, they'd all been brought into the intelligence division for intense questioning. While it soon became clear that they didn't know anything, the situation worsened when Kakashi refused to have his memory probed. He was taken away, and the remainder of their team was immediately put on house arrest with their ranks suspended. Fifteen hours had passed since then without their receiving word from anyone on the outside, and Sasuke was about to explode. Meanwhile, the entire situation had left Sakura already on the verge of a breakdown since the news of Eno's death. Curled up on the ground in the fetal position, mumbling nonsensically to herself. Even Menma, usually a ball of energy and source of non-stop mindless chatter, hadn't spoken a word since their house arrest. Though that may have been because at some point in the investigation, he'd gotten his mouth duct taped shut. As for Sasuke, he didn't know what to think. Naruto, killing a dozen leaf agents? Well, that, he could believe. Or at the very least, he believed Naruto was fully capable of having done it. But more importantly, Kakashi. His sensei, an accomplice? That was impossible, and he would swear it on his clan's crest if it came to it. Unfortunately, nobody cared what Amir Chunin thought, and once again, Sasuke felt frustration roiling in the pit of his stomach. His eyes furious and wet above the duct tape, Menma appeared to have turned the entire wall by the door into his personal punching bag. And as pointless as it was, Sasuke was on the verge of joining him when the door suddenly opened and a masked Hanbu stepped in. Ichiha Sasuke? He lowered his fist. That's me. The Hakage wishes to talk to you. The Anvil looked pointedly around the room at his teammates. Just you. Karen POV As they traveled south, the forest land gave way to an expanse of salt flats that reflected the night sky. Looking down at what appeared to be stars glimmering under her feet, Karen felt her breath catch. She'd never seen such a beautiful sight before. Looking coyly over at Naruto, she felt her cheeks heating up. 
Somehow, in the span of a few weeks, she had gone from having fat ugly grass nin draining her chakra to accompanying her crush under a starry night sky. How romantic, she thought. She was so lucky. Suddenly, something at her back stirred, rudely dragging her out of her fantasies. Gara, holding back a sigh, she warned Naruto, he's waking up. Her chakra chains had been holding Gara midair throughout their journey. The two of them came to an abrupt stop, sloshing the water at their feet. Through the entangled chains, Gara's dark-rimmed eyes were already wide open, regarding them in clouded confusion. Where am I? He struggled briefly to no avail. Where are you taking me? Gara, Naruto began calmly. You were losing control in the cell, and I decided to bring you with. I told you, Gara snarled. If you don't leave me alone, I'll kill you. Annoyed, Karen sniffed. I'd like to see you try. Her chains tightened around Gara, who let out a low growl. Karen, said Naruto. With a sigh, she loosened her chains by a fraction. Gara immediately jerked forward, but the chains remained bound around his form. Realization dawning upon his face, his back arched, his face contorted, lips drawing back to reveal his teeth, and Gara let out a scream. It was angry and hateful, but nothing like the screams Karen had heard back in the leaf village. With her chains sealing away Gara's tailed beast, the scream was solely human, and it soon petered away into nothing. Finally, facing the night sky, Gara muttered in a dark voice, I'm going to kill you. I have to. I have to. Frowning, she turned to Naruto. He's not going to come around, you know. Words have no effect on him. Suddenly, Naruto walked past her. Before she could cry out in warning, he'd raised a hand and gripped one of the chains binding Gara. You're a Jinchuriki. The Akatsuki will be coming after you soon. You have two choices. You can choose to stay with us and pray to survive another day. Or you can choose to leave and die when they extract your tailed beast from you. The decision is up to you. Karen swallowed, she could feel the chakra in the chain straining under the force that Naruto was exerting. I choose to kill you, Gara spat. I choose to listen to your screams as I rip you apart. Naruto paused. And then released a chain. Karen, let him go. Are you sure? He's out of immediate danger here. And I need your sensory abilities more than I need him. Despite the rising gravity of the situation, Karen flushed with pleasure, it was true that when her chains were activated, she was unable to use her mind's eye to sense anything she shot a look back at Gara. Though his body was relaxed, judging from the murderous look in his eyes, she wouldn't have been surprised if he made good on his promise the instant he was freed. Letting him go here was akin to releasing a rabid animal into the open. Still, Naruto was there with her. Closing her eyes, Karen traced the outline of her chakra that connected her to Gara. Though she wasn't exactly sure why it had taken the form of chains, somehow, it felt the most natural to her. She called it back now, and with a clinking sound, it began to unfurl itself. When the chains had completely disappeared back into Karen, her senses returned, and she found herself once again surrounded by two monstrous chakra signatures. Shivering, she opened her eyes. Only to realize that somehow, Gara had disappeared. In his place, a rising wall of sand glistened in the moonlight. There was no time to run, it was already surging towards them. Karen felt her eyes begin to widen, her body frozen in place, her mind replaying the scene of the Genin in the Chunin exams that had died from sand exploding through his body, and she thought, this is it. What followed next happened in the blink of an eye. One moment, Naruto was standing next to Karen, the next, there was something that could only be described as an explosion. Unbearable heat and wind buffeted her face, and the wall of sand crumbled apart. Coughing through the resulting cloud of dust, Karen could make out two figures on the ground it was Naruto. He had pinned Gara to the ground, both with a hand to the throat, and also with a pressure so suffocating, it stopped the shout in Karen's throat. As the air cleared, his changed features grew more apparent. His red hair fell to his shoulders, and the whisker marks on his face had grown pronounced, giving him a more feral appearance. Naruto's voice, however, was steely calm. You won't hurt her. I won't let you. Seemingly unable to move, Gara's eyes bulged in anger. Why, we're both Jinchuriki we have the same eyes. So what's the difference between you and me? The difference is that I know who my enemy is, said Naruto. Blood trickled down from the corner of Gara's lip, and he let out a maniacal laugh. Anyone who isn't me is my enemy. The whole damn world is my enemy. Was your sister your enemy, too? Gara's laugh cut off sharply. His eyes narrowed. Shut up. Shut up. Naruto ignored him. You did kill her, after all. Shut up. Her name was Damari, wasn't it? She was a good shinobi. She didn't deserve to die that way. She was just trying to stop you. The ground around them began to shake, and Gara's voice dropped to a cold whisper. Nobody can stop me. Nobody will stop me. 
And yet here we are. Though nothing changed in Naruto's expression, suddenly. Impossibly. The pressure in the air doubled. The ground fissured with a loud crack, and Karen stumbled, her pulse drumming in her ears. Then. Without warning, the pressure faded away, gone as quickly as it had arrived. Pulling back, Naruto reached up to his forehead and loosened his hit I ate. For a moment, he gripped it in his hand. Then, he dropped it, letting it land with a splash at his feet. If you ever find yourself in need of an ally, he said. Come find us. Gara didn't respond. Naruto began to move, and Karen followed him, looking back only once to see Gara's lone figure becoming smaller and smaller in the distance, before disappearing completely. Sasuke, POV Once the Anbu had delivered Sasuke to the Hakage's office, to his surprise, the agent bowed and backed out of the room. The door slammed resoundingly shut, leaving behind just Sasuke. And the man known as Shimura Danzo, who was currently seated behind the desk, wearing the hat that bore his new status as the fifth Hakage. A single dark eye regarded him from a face swathed in bandages, Sasuke wondered passingly whether he had lost his other eye in battle. He didn't know much about the man, only that he had been one of the third's advisors. The minutes began to tick by in silence. Nonplussed, Sasuke remained still, determined not to give anything away. Suddenly, Danzo spoke. Do you know why you're here? His voice had the low, raspy quality of someone intimate with silence. Sasuke scowled. Where's Kakashi-sensei? Once the intelligence division has determined he knows nothing of the Jinchuriki's escape, he will be allowed to return to his duties. You're torturing him? So long as he doesn't resist the interrogation, such methods will not be necessary. Touch a single hair on his head, said Sasuke. And we'll see how long you stay in this office. Danzo didn't look impressed. Watch your tongue, boy. That mulish pride was once your clan's undoing. I wouldn't be so hasty as to try and follow in your family's footsteps. Sasuke felt the heat rise in his face and took a step forward. You. I am the fifth Hakage. I will be addressed as such. Though Danzo hadn't raised his voice, Sasuke felt a chill that quickly quashed his temper. It suddenly struck him that while he may have never heard anything of Danzo's skill or accomplishments, all this meant was that he knew absolutely nothing about the other man. And on the battlefield, an ignorant shinobi was as good as dead. Kakashi-sensei would never betray the village. Hakage-sama, he gritted out. Nor do I know anything that could possibly help you find Naruto. To his surprise, Danzo replied, I know. I did not call you here to ask you of the Jinchuriki. Then why, while Kakashi is? Or was, I should say, famed for his use of the Sharingan, he never did manage to utilize it to its full extent. Danzo paused. It is about time you were properly trained. Taken aback, Sasuke blurted out, trained? By who? But he needn't have asked, before Danzo even spoke again, he knew the answer. By me, said Danzo, steepling his fingers together. I will be your teacher. Haku. POV. A torrent of rain welcomed their entry into rain country, and as droplets slid down Haku's bare face, he felt a shiver run down his back. Though they were nowhere near the village, back in the rain, it almost felt as though a pair of eyes was trained on his back. Now back in familiar territory, it quickly became clear that their newfound guide was not going to follow the great river to the hidden rain as they'd expected. When they caught their first glimpse of high-rising mountains in the distance, instead of terrain flattening out to marshland, Ajisai came to a screeching stop. Where are you taking us? She demanded, a hand creeping to her pouch. Are you really our ally? With a look at his teammate, Haku followed suit, drawing Senban needles in a flash. Kabuto turned around, his hands raised. I didn't lie. I'm taking you to your leaders. And where would that be? We're nearby, said Kabuto. The guide is going to meet us to take us the rest of the way. Ajisai's expression grew cool. Well, if you're really not lying, then you won't mind this. Before Kabuto could react, Haku flicked his wrists. The thin needles flew through the air, embedding themselves in Kabuto's chest. Taut string, barely perceptible to the naked eye, connected the needles to Haku. These needles will tell me whether you're lying or not, he explained. When Kabuto's eyes bulged, he added, don't worry, they're thin enough that they won't kill you. Unless you move around too much. Now, said Ajisai, drawing closer. Let's do that again. That won't be necessary, came a new voice. Alarmed, Haku's head turned just in time to catch something blue fly through the air. A bird? Before landing on the shoulder of a girl emerging from the rising fog. Where had she come from? Haku hadn't sensed her at all. While she was dressed in dark Akatsuki robes, she couldn't have been more than Haku's age, if not younger. 
With her bright orange hair and the series of piercings in her face, he was quite sure he had never seen her before. And yet, something about her features left him feeling deeply unsettled. What's going on? Who are you? Haku asked. A pair of ringed eyes turned towards him. You do not recognize your god? It was a girl's voice, but at the sound of it, Ajisai let out a loud gasp before immediately lowering herself to her knees. Lord Pain, she murmured in reverence. In a flash, Haku thought of the stories his mother had once told him when he was young. In particular, the story of a faceless being that stole children's faces and wore them as masks. Though the stories had referred to it as a god, in his nightmares, it had always looked more like that of a demon. The girl beckoned towards them, her pale face devoid of all human emotion. Follow me, and all will be revealed. End of chapter 44